I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed Podcast. Uh, Jace, you got the breaking news button? I got some breaking news. Breaking news. We're having, <laughs> we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> I've never seen someone have such a hard time <laughs> pressing a big red button, Jace. Good night. <laughs> Well, look, these button that designs, was... this is this is basically a protest against the world. Why would you invent a button that you have to push twice in order for it to work? Yeah. Oh man, that was we gotta get a new button. Just think about that. All your technology and you said, let's do a breaking news button. But guess what? It's not breaking enough to where you can press the button once. Well, I think it's to protect you in case of if you... An accidental... Yeah, you don't actually breaking. have breaking news and you hit it. They want you to have a second chance to be like, that's wait, right. actually, that's, that's, a- that's not breaking. Well, we should call that an oh, wait button. <laughs> yeah. Push the oh, button. Wait. Oh, wait. I didn't realize that was going to be such a hard task. but yeah. So we do have some breaking news. So as this airs uh, today on March 11th, tomorrow, March 12th, uh, is when Dad's book releases. So we're super excited about that. And I, I don't think I've mentioned this on the podcast. This is such big news. Uh, I guess I just it slipped my mind. But uh, Dad has generously and unusually uh, offered a duck hunt as a sweepstakes for those of you that buy – a book um, this week. And so we're super excited about that. So if you want to get a chance to hunt uh, with dad and I guess you, Jace, I guess you'll be there. Um, well, I wasn't conferred about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a running suspicion that Jace was not going to commit. So but, let's yeah. just put it on the bottom in the fine print. Jace may or may not be attending. <laughs> it probably depends a lot on whether there's any ducks, where Jace is, who knows. Oh, uh, that's funny. So this is with uh, Premier Collectibles is the group that does this and it's a uh, it's signed copies um, of, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. And you go to Phil Robertson book.com is where you go for this one. So it's Phil Robertson book.com. So if you buy a signed copy uh, from these folks, uh, you will go into a sweepstakes and an opportunity uh, to visit. Uh, not only it'll be a hunt, but I think there'll be a, a lunch or some sort of meal. Uh, associated with that as well. So that's that's big news. That that's, is big uh, news. And uh, thank you, Dad, for being so generous with that. It gives folks a chance to meet you. Yeah. And, of course, get a great book on top of that. Zach, did you have some breaking news, too? I did. I hate to announce at the same time that we're pushing the book, but The Blind is going to be on GAC Pure Flix platform. I have no other information right now, but we uh, I probably shouldn't even announce it this early, but uh, – Actually, I think in a few weeks. Uh, but, yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll let you know. Phil, that's a streaming service. Um, so, Dad, you do a lot of streaming um, at home? Streaming or screaming? <laughs> <laughs> I do a little bit of both. I, I'm the last man you would want to talk to about modern events. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think every Dad once thinks- in a while, my only attachment to the the world it's Dan, and uh, he's riding around now on a motorcycle. And his dad, which is a good friend of mine, he's my age, and uh, we've you know been following Jesus a long time. But uh, I would be, get little blurbs. Dan would put it in front of me, and he said, "That's what's going on out." And he'll tell me wherever it is, and I, I, I he, I got a little update on how our culture is going up or down so dan is the one that he's my only connection to the outer world Mm. so he's he shows you videos and different things that are happening out there in the world he said listen to this yeah he he sets it in front of me i'll be drinking a cup of coffee and i'll be looking at what he's saying but that's my only connection with the outside world Mm. the rest of it is such a big pile of crap (laughs) that it's hard to to take it on the chin it's 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 pathetic that's what it is well, that, well that's tell, a, tell us I how you really feel <laughs> i mean miss k's in the hospital she's sick 
She's and, been uh, sick. She's Lay in her it. 70s. Well, I'm in my late 70s, and uh, I got a birthday coming up April, so I'm two years shy of 80. Well, I, my, 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 my days are, are beginning to slow down a little bit. You, you know what I'm saying? I feel perfectly fine. No aches, no pains, no nothing. I weigh what you ought to weigh. So I'm just kind of, kind of, kind of going with the deal. But every time I look at my culture out there in these United States, it's just a sorrowful thing. Yeah. It's not, not me mad at them. It's just a, so I'm trying my best to get Jesus in front of them. I want to remind you of the gospel that was preached. It's the gospel that, you know, by this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word. What I received, I passed you of first importance that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. I'm right there until my days are over here. It's been a good run. but I've, I've helped bring many, many to God. So th- th- this book and all this going on in the movies, the blind, you know, just glimpses of what I used to be. They got that in there. So we're, we're just... We're just trying to win, get people to see there is hope. And there's 2,000-year-old writings, and they've weathered it, and they are there front and center. It's right there in front of me and everybody else. It's hard to get this kind of information in front of the world over a 2,000-year-old pattern. But it has worked, and the Almighty made sure it went from shore to shore worldwide so dad moses wrote about almost 4000 years ago it's a long time ago he yep. wrote a psalm psalm 90 and in that psalm he said that a man on earth will get about 70 years 80 if he has the strength was the way he put it to yep. to serve god or not so it's really interesting that an ancient man 4000 years ago wrote that and that's right about where you are Yep. I mean, it's pretty I, impressive. I looked, somebody reminded me, uh, I looked for some information, uh, and I think it's here. I can find it right quick. One thing is worthy of note. Uh, he, talking about me, the author of this book, along with old Dasher there, Dasher Gordon was married to my sister before she went on to meet the Lord, godly woman. He has remarried, but the way this has worked out is the author of this book that's coming out tomorrow, I have five children, 19 grandchildren, and 13 great-grandchildren. Well, that's quite the number if you just look at them. When they all get together, it's a, it's a house full. About 60. Yeah, about 60 right there, so, you know. Just something worthy of note, you know. So that's my, I don't know how long I'll be with them, but hey. <laughs> well, you know, uh, some people listening to this may they say, man, y'all, you guys are morbid. But, you know, going back to Psalms 90, um, Al, you mentioned it just a second ago. We're actually told here to, you know, uh, he says in verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So teach yeah. us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom or teach us to realize the brevity of life that we may grow in wisdom. Uh, it really is healthy to to contemplate your mortality because it, it when you do contemplate and talk about your own mortality, you're, you're numbering your days. You're realizing that, that this time here is finite, which what that does if you're a believer in Jesus is it, it pushes you into – uh, seeking a, a heart of wisdom and to really understand that, that this side is short, but God's made us for so much more. And so to lean into that so much more side of what, what we're doing. So it's actually a healthy thing. So that we talk about this, I love that about our family that we've always really talked about life and death in this way. And it's uh, been helpful for me in my faith. You know that about it. Yeah. I had a, I had a viewer Ask me a question in the grocery store, which has become really my connection to the world. 
So uh, Phil's got Phil's got Dan, and you've got uh, Jay you've got says Brookshire's. Brookshire's. Yeah, I got a. <laughs> is it Brookshire's or is it Brookshire's? Well, it's Dan Brookshire's. Said, but... Dan said when he alerted his dad, Dan gave him the information that he had just purchased a, a motorcycle, and I said, "What'd your dad say?" Because I recommended that he not do that. I'd already told him. I said I wouldn't do that. I said it's too dangerous a machine, Dan. Four wheels are safer than two. So he told his dad, and he said, for 30 seconds, there was silence. <laughs> and he said, well, son, all I can tell you is you've been a good son. <laughs> and you got the motorcycle. Are you riding it? Yeah. In the traffic? Yeah. He said, you've been a good good son, and I'm proud of you. Whoa. That... He... <laughs> so Dan said it didn't take but seconds for him to be <laughs> told. 30 seconds. 30, he said, that's all of it. Well, we had a we had a cousin that we had a cousin that lost his leg on a motorcycle. We were actually visiting that side of the Robertson family when in that Houston, happened. When it happened, so it's seared in my memory. I was a little kid, but he had uh, Jimmy Frank, Uncle Jimmy Frank, had told him not to buy the motorcycle. Yeah. He bought the motorcycle at sixteen years old. Went and got a bag of groceries. Had the groceries in one hand, steering the motorcycle in the other hand, on his way home after just buying it and wrecked. And lost his leg at sixteen. So I, I've always been a that's seared in my memory. You know what I mean? It's I can't get and it cut his life short. He's one of our two cousins, first cousins that you know that uh, passed on in his early fifties. So yeah, I mean, Dad had drilled in us no motorcycles, and then when yeah, that, that was, happened that to our cousin, of, that was yeah. it. Yeah, they was, said, "How come, my Dad? How come you don't want us having them?" I said, "They'll fall over." <laughs> yeah, that's true. Profound. I said, there's two tires, one behind the other, and it'll fall over. So if you're listening to this podcast driving down the road on a Harley. <laughs> we love you. Which is happening. I guarantee you. Put Jesus in the center of your life, which goes we, back to my story that I never all right, hang finished. Hang on, Jay. I, I've been, I want to hear this Brookshire story, but let's take a break, Bert. I would imagine that that hospital couch slash bed that uh, is in a patient's room is not quite the same as your Helix sleep back home. We were talking about Missy uh, visiting uh, the hospital and spending a, a few nights there. And uh, um, I would imagine, I'm just guessing, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. Well, I've noticed a pattern here. Uh, she'll come in the next day because she has the night shift. And the first thing she does is she goes in there and piles up on the Helix and <laughs> takes a nap. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to get her just a little bit, right? Exactly. Uh, we uh, we've been talking about Helix Sleep for a while. They're pe- uh, they're a premium mattress brand uh, that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. Uh, they have up to twenty unique mattresses. Um, so they got everything to get you covered. You can get a personalized mattress that ships straight to your door, free of charge, which we love. They have a hundred night trial. So you get to try for a hundred nights. That's almost a third of a year to make sure that it fits you perfectly. Uh, what I did was I went to helixsleep.com and I, they have a quiz there that you can take. And I took it and they told me that I needed the moonlight mattress because I wanted a soft mattress. And that's what Lisa likes as well. And so that's what we got. So it's as simple as that. And uh, we didn't need a hundred nights to know that we loved it. Right now, Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our unashamed listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20. find myself in a weird position today which is hard to get a word in edgewise <laughs> but i was asked from welcome to our world jay a listener why do you keep saying jesus is better than miracles why is that a big deal to you which you got to remember i'm i'm here trying to figure out if i'm on which kind of grits i'm gonna buy you know and a guy walks up hey Hey, hey, do it. Good to see you. Why do you think it's such a big deal? Why do you keep saying that? 
<laughs> so it kind of. I didn't want to come back with it. How do you feel about grits? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take thirty seconds. I took about five, and I said, "Well, because he's alive." Of course, that just <laughs> he got a dumbfounded look, and it's like, "What?" I was like, "You got to remember all the miracles that were done to point people to Jesus. They're all dead." Yeah. yeah. He's alive, which is my message to you when you start thinking about your age. You know, Jesus is alive. I mean, we started in in Acts 1 where it said in my former book, I wrote about what Jesus began to do. And so then it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven. And, And the guy that brought you to the Lord, one of his famous sayings were, uh, was he would talk about what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. But what yeah. I've noticed is we tend to focus on what he has done and what he will do. But you can't forget, well, he's alive. Yeah, he, he, is, doing. he is doing. And thus he poured out his Holy Spirit as the exalted King and Lord of all, which he is right now as I speak. He, he, he's alive. So that was kind of my point to the question that our viewer asked, was he, he's better because he, he's alive, and, and ultimately we will be with him forever, no matter what happens to you on this earth. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good or uh, bad. Yeah, and that's, you know, I mean, it's so good that you brought that point home because in, in where we are right now in the book of Acts, uh, we're in this like section of Acts three and four where a miracle has taken place, and this is sort of the, you know, we've already had the the speaking in languages and everything that kind of kicked this thing off in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then we see it manifested in this forty uh, year old plus man who everybody knew had been crippled his whole life, and Peter and John heal him, and but they do it all in the name of Jesus, which to your point, Jace, how many times did we say the name of Jesus? Just in the text, it was mentioned several times, but in the book of Acts, over 50 times and over 200 times in the New Testament, this idea is that the name of Jesus and the person of Jesus is why the miracles occurred, which is, you know. Well, right. That's kind of my point. It's like I think we as believers in Jesus get the wrong idea here in Acts 1 where we're like, well, he left. So we're, you know, it's kind of like when you're a kid, which because you have this being that we call God that has these three distinct personalities, but is one God. But, you know, I remember, Phil, when you left, well, the rest of the the family got into a lot of chaos, uh, <laughs> fighting, Mis- mischief, mischief. <laughs> <laughs> because you were literally hundreds of miles away. So there is no accountability whatsoever. And so that's why I made that point about what he's doing. It, it's a false idea that he went a million miles away. It, you know, because time and space really, I mean, we the, the Bible writers have trouble even relating how that happened because he's no longer bound by time and space. But he pours out his Holy Spirit and even in Acts 17, when he when he when Paul preaches the sermon to those who are following all these other gods, even to the unknown God, he makes a point saying in Acts 17 that he's not far, though he's not far from each one of us. That's uh, Acts 17, 27. God, and to your point, the the problem arises. If you read the first section of John, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus. The Word was with God, Jesus. And the mm-hmm. Word was God, Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Well, that's clarified on where everything came from. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. That life was the light of men. And and listen to this. The light shines in the darkness, 
Jesus, but the darkness has not understood it. To this day, that holds true. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, is at, who is at the Father's side, like you say, to your point, Chase, has made him known. Well, exactly. But even Paul, you know, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5. They said, he and, said they, they don't understand it. And they had a guy, uh, you know, doing acts that were obviously wrong, sexual immorality in that case. And they were talking about how to handle that in the church. But Paul made an interesting notation in 1 Corinthians 5, 5. He said, when you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and then Paul said, and I'm with you in spirit. But then he said, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. Well, how, well why would he say that? Hmm. Now, obviously. The solution is right in front of him. Yeah, through his spirit, which they is what. I haven't understood it. Which is, we already declared that the book of Acts is Acts of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Through, through, through being unleashed through human beings. And that declaration of in Jesus' name is declaring the presence of Jesus himself. Just just knowing that, that's why when you you read Acts 4 through 7, because Acts 2 and 3 sounds, oh my goodness, this is awesome, everything is great. And then all of a sudden we, we get in Acts 4 and opposition starts to occur. Persecution, being led to jail. Yep. Then you get to five, and all of a sudden, there's people claiming to believe that God is present and real, and then they're doing things for the praise of men instead of trying to please God, which we'll get into in Ananias and Sapphira, which is right. probably one of the, the more departure, scary passages. As some of them confused, when he departs, well, they said, well, he's, he's out of here. But instead of saying he's gone, and he's out of here. He said, "Oh no, he's he's all all worldwide. He's active. He's alive through individuals who say, I believe yeah. it. I believe he's the way.' Exactly. So we so in the text we left off. Peter and John had been thrown into jail because of they healed this man, and then they let him out. And when they get out, they basically Peter just boldly, you know proclaims Jesus to this same group that had crucified Jesus, same leaders. I mean, nothing's changed. It's just a few weeks later. And so they don't back off and they threaten them and they tell them you can't speak. And, and they're just like, no, we're going to speak. You know, we're, you're not going to shut this down. So they're very bold in their response to it. And it's really interesting because, and that takes us up to where we left off in, in chapter four, verse 23, because when they're released, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So this is like now they're out there fully as being the followers. And so now that everybody knows, I mean, this is this is Jesus 2.0 is what they're. Th I mean, this is the movement is going strong. And when the people heard this in verse 24, these are this new Christians. This is the new group that is formed. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. So their response when they told him everything that happened was a prayer. And this prayer is amazing. I mean, the Bible is new Testament, especially is full of a lot of prayers, but now this is a humdinger of a prayer right here. Here's the, here's what they said. Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, which dad, you just read that in John one, you spoke by the Holy spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David, and that was good insight that they even recognized the Holy Spirit back in David's day. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. These are quotes from Psalm 118 and Psalm 2. And it's interesting because they're even recognizing in the moment that this is not only a spiritual battle, but even still a political battle it's still going on. And then they say this in their prayer, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So here's we see this collaboration of Gentiles, Jews, Jewish leaders 
to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So they're letting all of us know that God's still in control. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders. Here we go, Jays. Through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It's quite the prayer. And after they prayed, verse 31, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I don't even know what that means, but something happened there. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So that's the reaction to this miracle and them being jailed and them being threatened and them being told to shut up and don't talk about Jesus. And in, the, in the middle of all that, Al, you got to remember, they were standing there seeing and observing the departure. Well, in their mind, a lot of them thought, well, he's gone. <laughs> Right. They they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood there and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken from you into heaven, and they all watched it. So they said, Well, he's out of here. He's gone. He'll come back in the same way you've seen him go. And to this day, that has proven to be true. Now, there's no doubt that's true. Let's take another break. So, Jace, I got a question for you. Are you a lover of your liver? I'm not sure. <laughs> but I know this. I can't live without it. So, technically, I love that liver, Al. You said this before, Jace. You can't spell liver without live, right? Exactly. And the liver is a crucial part uh, of our system and our body uh, to be able to filter things out. We also know from the American Heart Association that if you have a fatty liver, you have a three and a half times more likely chance to have heart failure. This affects about 100 million Americans a year. So we've got a lot of fatty livers out there and everything gets thrown at it from cholesterol to toxins to Tylenol to cigarettes to all sorts of things that don't help you. And your liver has 500 key functions every day that you need to live. So we got a solution for you. If you've got this problem, and I've had it myself, it's liver health formula. It's an all-natural supplement. It has 11 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver uh, I took this product. My liver enzymes were high. All my numbers were right back in line by the next time that I got checked. So it does work. If you're looking to ignite your fat burning metabolism, boost your energy and transform how you look and feel, try liver health formula, receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula to reduce your sugar cravings. When you order today, try liver health formula by going to get liverhelp.com slash unashamed you're going to get that free gift as well. That's getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. And this goes back to what you just read to Zach's point earlier, that there was an urgency that is now brought in, even in that moment of it just happening. And that urgency still goes to this very day. That's right. Is Jesus still working? Is he still working through us? Is his Holy Spirit still impacting? So I think it's a, I think it still goes. Yeah, despite forward. incredible opposition, I was just reading at the history of the early church. I mean, there were ten major campaigns to end Christianity. You know, from this time to three hundred A.D. I mean, to wipe it out. There was in, in Roman history. You see this. There was a hundred years of time during the first three hundred years after this where it was illegal to be a Christian. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, I also saw this this quote from Tertullian, who was many thought, you know, was kind of the first Pentecostal. He was into the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he said, the blood of Christians is seed, because he wrote that at about 120, I guess, yep. A.D. But his point was that, as much opposition came to them from killing them and trying to stop it, 
it just every time they killed a bunch of them, it actually it was like seed. It just planted more and more belief. And so when you kind of look at it in that vein, it gives more credence to every time they keep saying we were witnesses of this. They believed that Jesus was at the right hand of God. They had God's Holy Spirit. You literally could not stop it. That's it. Despite, I mean, the greatest attempt to stop it that you could. And it's in our lap right now. To, to, to It's covered the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Right in front of us. Because every other religious movement, you kill the leader and, and the movement dies. That's in this when the case, started here. You killed the leader. It flur. It just took off like a bang. And then for three hundred years, you events. You you go and and continue to try to stop it, yeah. just through killing every person that declared themselves They're still a follower of Jesus. Well, and then it comes full circle, and it becomes the religion of Rome after three hundred years. I mean, it's just incredible that that happened. Well, we were we were in Rome with Zach and Dad uh, filming uh, the movie Torchbearer that Dad narrated and Zach wrote. Um, we marveled at just walking through the Colosseum, which is still in pretty good shape, you know, after all these years, and Nero's Gardens, which were just right across the street from that, and hearing the stories about what happened to a lot of Christians in both of those places. I mean, terrible, gruesome, awful yeah. things. That happened, and as we looked around, uh, remember, Dad, when we went into the Colosseum, someone at some point in history put a cross in the Roman Colosseum. I, it wasn't there originally, but someone put one in there, and it was just that picture of seeing that cross there that was like, no, we triumph even over everything that went down here. You know, we're still here. We're we're still professing. We were over there making a movie about you know Christianity being better than all the world's religions and the kingdom of God being number one. And that cross to me just symbolized that in this place where all these things have happened through the years. Yeah, too. You, you, when you're there in Rome, you, I mean, you're looking at ruins, obviously uh, in a lot of places, but even the ruins are pretty magnificent and you do, you, you can understand we've said this before. I think on this podcast, we said it when we were there, if some guy's coming in from Africa from living in a mud hut and he comes into Rome at the peak of the Roman Empire and Caesar says, I'm God, you can kind of understand why they may have said, OK, I get it. You know what I mean, like it, it, it was so magnificent. And to think about the power of the Roman Empire, I mean, this stadium where the, the Colosseum is huge. And I just looked this up the other day. It took them. I want to say eight years to build it without any modern, I may be off a little bit, but it wasn't like 50 years or something. Yeah. You're thinking they have no crane. They have, they don't have cranes. They don't have modern engineering. They don't have track hose and uh, yeah, they'd have none of this. And they built this facility that is humongous. And, and I, I say all that to say, man, we were talking about the epicenter of power. And then and this is, by the way, prophesied in Daniel 2, when it talked about in the days of the Roman Empire, there was going to be this stone that was going to roll down this hill, and it was going to hit the bottom of this statue, which was the Roman Empire, and it was going to collapse everything. It was The whole thing's coming down. And in those days, uh, the prophet says there'll be a kingdom set up that can't be shaken nor destroyed. I mean, you got to understand this. I mean, we're talking about the epicenter of hegemonic power, and then this guy is born as a baby to a virgin in a stable in a manger and through this person named jesus the whole thing was about to start and i mean it, it, it you would not have planned it this way and I, I i it's just so incredible to think about the the coming of the kingdom and the way that it came was not in a, a power dynamic that anyone would have interpreted in that time period but yet it was it was Christ in the coming of the kingdom that that, that actually did take it down eventually, um, and I, I read this verse twenty eight in chapter four of Acts. It says that all of this had been predestined to take place. Yeah. God had planned it all. Yeah, He had planned the whole thing. And so you think, man, I would have never come up with that plan. Well, yeah, you wouldn't have, but you know who did? God did. 
And it's that plan and that sovereignty of God that we get to rest in, um, which enables us into the boldness that we can have because our boldness is not based on our own effort or ability to package any of this up. We just simply rest in what God's done and talk about it. Well, and I think you see a pattern here developing of people declaring Jesus, being threatened, being jailed, and then the believers praising God for that. But you are seeing, to your point, Al, the presence of Jesus being made known, being at the right hand of God, because it it even goes back to what he said in chapter 3 that we read in verse 12, where it said, Peter saw this and he said, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? And he goes on to say, verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus's name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you all can see. And they're saying the same thing, you know, even now in 4 and 28, when it says they did what your power and will had decided beforehand. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And it made me think the reason they're they're having such confidence, because you're like, man, I wish we could have that today, this kind of courage and and confidence. I mean, what happened? It just seems like now, even though we're part of the same group doing the same thing, we're a little lacking in that courage and confidence. Yeah, there was a little more information that, that they had sort of didn't didn't quite get in Acts chapter one, after he had gone back into heaven. Therefore, in twenty one, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism, and you can meet it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Well, that that just took place. For one of these, one of the guys that would follow Jesus, must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So this needs to be clarified that that we have individuals who were there at the resurrection. They were became a witness with us of his resurrection. That had to so you had one on the on the on the on the tark, if you if you say he was there the whole time, in and out, and all these predictions and what would happen, well that's he had one out there that's saying, I was there the whole time. I saw him die. I saw him raised from the dead. And so that's, then they took off. They they had enough information. The death of Jesus, his burial and resurrection. Yeah, which was God's plan all along. I mean, he had yeah. the witnesses. He exalts Jesus, despite what the, you know, the world might think, that God is in control. He is. And he oh. gives the Holy Spirit. And then you see all these gifts of the Holy Spirit that are undeniable. Yep. Yeah. But it still wasn't enough to change their hearts and minds from a persecution level. And, and it's, I think they, they went back to some of the words that Jesus would say, because cause they're having all these aha moments when they look back in being with Jesus, which to your point, Phil, I think is why that was a prerequisite to be able to have these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I thought about John 10, 10, where he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy which they're seeing that from various leaders and powers. Even in Acts chapter 5, we're going to get to a similar line that you see happen in Jesus' day while he was training them and showing them what God was like when when they said, how has Satan so filled your heart, you know, where you're yeah. holding back this money. They're, they're seeing this battle, but then to continue in John 10, he says, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then three times he uses this phrase in verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He then says it again in verse 15, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
And then he says, verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I I received from my father. And the point I'm trying to make is when you see this kind of courage, it only happens when it happens voluntarily. They're not doing this over any other agenda except they believe that Jesus is alive and is working through them via the Holy Spirit. They were accused because some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Peter gets up and says, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's just nine in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel said. Yeah. And he ends it up by saying everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. Yeah, they believe this is real. And where I'm kind of going with this is the difference in a hero, because these guys are heroes. They're risking their life. Yep. They're willing to lay it down because they believe this is is real, and they're functioning on the energy of the Holy Spirit and, and the wisdom. Yep. But when you think about, like, we, we tend to think of them as stars in the faith. But, you know, the difference is when you think about who a star is and what makes a star, like what we would think in our modern culture, it's that other people, they, they've gotten the approval of other people. That's what a celebrity is. People think they're cool. But you'll see this contrast as we go through Acts. Are you looking for the praise of men? Or are you looking for God's approval? Well, when you look for God's approval, you all of a sudden start doing things that are uncharacteristic in our world, like willing to lose your life over a message. Yeah. I mean, that's why I brought up the, it was a hundred, it was a hundred years right after this that it's illegal to declare that publicly. So it's this battle the whole time of shut up. We don't want to hear it because it's threatening our agenda and what we want to do and be the best you can be and and it's that agenda versus, no, there is a way to have life to the full, which is ultimately living forever with your loved ones. Now, Jason, I'm so glad you brought that up about from John 10, because I think Luke, this next section in verse 32 down to 37 of Acts 4, is going to describe the situation, and it sounds very uh, utopic. I mean, it, it's this is like, man, so many people have strived for this setting, but you can't forget that Satan is still at work. And so let me read that section, at least to get us ready, because it's going to lead us into five that we'll talk about in the next podcast. He says, out of this, remember, there's the Holy Spirit's being poured out. Man, the people are excited. They're paying, praying bold prayers. And it says, all the believers... We're one in heart and mind, which is what we all want, right? We want unity. We want closeness. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. So it's almost a communal type experience that they're having here. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So they haven't stopped. And much grace was upon them all. So they're living the dream. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So it's a very community-oriented situation. There, there's trust there. There's helping people. So this is so many people have strived for this on earth. They're like, if we could just get this utopia, you know, this place where we're all equal and all the same. Some and then he tried to make a little money out of it. And they really got in a bind, Ananias and Seth. Well, and that's that becomes the point, right? So yeah. verse 36, we, we see Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles call Barnabas. So this is the, introduce, the introduction of Barnabas, who is going to be Paul's sidekick. But I love his name, which means son of encouragement. They changed his name because he was such an encourager. And, Jace, I couldn't read this without thinking about our old friend Robert Dixon, Robert and Bertha from WFR, just this, the sweetest brother you ever met. And he started a ministry at WFR called the Barnabas Ministry. And it was just a ministry of encouragement. He sent cars to people on their birthday. Something happens. He comes to the hospital, visits you. And I thought, man, that, that still goes forward 
2,000 years later for people. So this Barnabas sells a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So all that is a setup for what's about to happen. And I think the reason Luke includes this is because he shows you how great it was and how unified the people are. But then you got to realize they're just, they're people. And so, you know, people are going to fall into temptation. Problems are going to arise. And so the next couple of chapters that we're going to get into are problematic for this early group. And and we understand that all these, you know, 2000 years later, that there is no utopia on earth because you have people and people are going to fall short and people are going to sin and people are going to lead people in a path that's not good. You start reading the epistles when Paul writes and his whole thing is about watch out for these divisive people. They're false teachers. They come in, they lead you away. They're, they're like Satan masquerading as an angel of light. So you're starting to see that it's not going to be perfection on earth even though it's so much better than it was because you understand who Jesus is. Right? So I think he's setting the story up to take us to the next level. Well, I also think it, it's making sense of passages that are hard to figure out when you read in the Gospels like Matthew 19, 27 and 28. When Remember when he said this is the story about the, you know, the rich young ruler where Jesus said, go sell everything you have. Yep. And... They were like, well, this is impossible. If you're, It seems impossible if you have a lot of money. And he made that famous quote in 26, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter said, well, we've left everything. And then Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Just listen to this wording. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, which we now have in Acts here. It's happening. You who have followed me will also sit, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And then when Mark gave the same account in Mark 10, 29, he says the same thing. Anyone who has left fields and houses, father, Uh, mother, brothers, or sisters, for me and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters. But then it says, and with them, persecutions. But in the age to come, eternal life. So I think you're seeing that being played out because even though this does look like a utopia setting and we read this, and I've heard many sermons in churches about this. And they're like, why can't we pull this off? But you got to realize when this happens, you are fixed to be persecuted vehemently. Oh, <laughs> Trouble exactly. is happening. This led to the greatest persecution of, of the church in, in that hundred year period than any other time, which is, it just shows you that this is a battle of powers doing it God's way. Or man's way. It, it, and we would have never have gotten it unless these these texts here were put here. That that that's an explanation of what's going on because everybody's running in every direction around there. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah. when we're all together in the afterlife, that is when it will truly be smooth sailing. But for now, this is not going to come without persecution, threats, and even you know, threats to life as seasons come and go on our earth. When you're out there declaring Jesus as Lord, the powers that be, and a lot of them that we create, you know, just man-made ideals of how culture and life should go, that they're they're not going to put up with that. And what came out of it is, is the temple came down. Just, well, yeah, that was one thing because because they were holding on to that religious oh. form, which they viewed this as a as a threat. Well, and remember, this is this is one of the dangers of utopia thinking as well, because Jason made a very valiant point there. That remember when Jesus told him in Acts one nine, he said, "You're going to start in Jerusalem, then you're going to go to Judea, Samaria, and the utter ends of the earth." 
with this message that I've given you to share. But Utopia doesn't want to go out from anywhere when you've got things going so great for me. I mean, in other words, my needs are being met. Uh, you know, I, I'm not having to worry about money. You know, people are, are very generous and all, these are all positive, good things, but they tend to put us inward. And that's the problem with this sort of thinking. And his whole idea was that they would go out. And so, Jace, you said it in Acts chapter eight, when we get there, it says a great persecution broke out against the church. And guess where they went? Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the utter ends of the earth with the good news. And it happened because they couldn't stay in one place. And that's what the gospel does. It doesn't allow you to turn it inward. Uh, Although churches many times try to do that. Let me just get my comfortable place where we're all comfortable and only thinking about ourselves. But how, how well does that work out? It doesn't. That's not our mission. It wasn't the mission from the start. So it's a big part of it. Great. All right. So we're out of time. Uh, We'll pick up here because the story that we're going to go into in the next podcast, I'm with Jay's. It's one of the most frightening, um, to be quite honest, difficult texts for me, especially being a church leader to, to deal with because it's gruesome and it's, and it shows you how serious God considers the heart and the Holy spirit. So we'll get into that on the next podcast, Acts chapter five. Um, We'll see you next time on Unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.